Thank you. Hello, everybody. Nice to be with you. I just tell you a little bit about me so you know who I am. Sarah's met me. Okay. Uh, my name's Pastor Michael. I. Oh, please sit down. Please sit down. <laughs> I. Uh, I work for Revelation TV and I do a program that comes out every Thursday at midnight to 2 a.m. Friday morning. It's called Voice in the Wilderness. And people ring up and they send texts in and emails. People sometimes are in the most desperate, desperate state. And that's basically what I do. I am an ordained pastor. I pastor three churches. One in Hackney, one in Tottenham, and one in central London. And the Lord called me out of pastoring churches to work in deliverance. And I didn't know where they were coming from. But after a few minutes, I realised that was words of a song. And I put out as much paper as I could and I wrote these words down. And the Lord said to me, wherever you preach anywhere, sing this song. And I'm going to sing it for you now. It's called God's Gonna Heal You. Amen. And literally I received this five minutes from the Holy Spirit and he gave me a tune and he gave me everything. And it goes like this. It says, if you're coming here today and your life has gone astray, God's gonna heal you right now. If you're feeling so forlorn and your spirit's tossed and torn, God's gonna heal you right now. God's gonna heal you. God's gonna heal you. God's gonna heal you right now. God's gonna heal you right now If you feel you can't go on And your hope is all but gone God's gonna heal you right now God's gonna heal you God's gonna heal you God's gonna heal you, gonna heal you right now Now they alleviated it by calcium by giving school milk. 
Well, in those days, you didn't have school milk. And when you walk down the road, your bones go. And they make those noises as you walk, every joint aches. And one morning, I had a direct encounter with Jesus Christ. I asked the Lord to help me because I was in such a state. And I remember a bright light came into the room and shone on the wall next to me. And I put out my right hand. And all this light went up my hand, all went round my head, round my face, and I felt the peace of God. And I knew I had a calling in my life. Well, the calling never came till I was 40 years of age, and I'm 62 now. Because in the 1960s, what they called the swinging 60s, I did everything a man shouldn't do. I used to drink. I am a recovered alcoholic now. I was an alcoholic by the time I was 25. And I am a recovered alcoholic now. And the Lord has done great things in my life. That's why I'm with him now. And John 10, verse 10, speaks of Jesus being the good shepherd. Let's just have a look at that. John 10, verse 10. Hallelujah. Who said hallelujah? That little guy said hallelujah. Did she? <laughs> she said that she said hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. John 10, verse 10, makes it very clear. It says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. When we go through life, we're like sponges. Human beings are like sponges. We absorb. If you put a sponge in a water, it absorbs all the liquid. We're like that emotionally. We absorb all the things that happen to us in our lives. You know, some children, before they reach the age of 11 and 12, they've gone through their mother and father's marriage breaking up. They may have gone through older siblings leaving home and not coming back. I experienced all those things when I was a child. And it hurts you. By the time you leave school and you start work, you're already carrying so many burdens. You may be a young teenager and you fall in love with someone. It might be a girl who falls in love with a man. It might be a man who falls in love with a girl. And you think this is going to be the person you're going to be spending the rest of your life with. And they let you down. They betray you. You know? And you find you're on your own again. And the person you loved can't be relied on. Well, that hurts us so grievously. And when we carry all these hurts, Satan looks into that open door in our life. It might be emotional hurts. It might be all sorts of things. And he exploits it. And it's Satan's job to keep us away from Jesus. Satan's job to keep us away from Jesus. If you go to the book of Revelation and you go to Revelation 12, you will see about the fall of Satan. You can see what happened to him. Because of his pride, because of his arrogance, because of his rebellion against God. I'll read it to you now and then I'll explain it to you. It's quite long. Revelation 12 says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, the twelve stars of the twelve tribes of Israel. That's what they represent. Then being with child, she cried out in labour and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. Hallelujah. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. What that actually means is a third of all the angels in heaven who listened to Satan's lies actually followed him. He was able to convince a third of all the angels God created to follow him in his rebellion. And it said his tail drew a third of the stars out of heaven and they were flown to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled in the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. What you are reading about now, you're reading about the birth of Jesus and the attempt to destroy Jesus when Herod destroyed all the firstborn of Israel. Well, that's what that's describing. Then it says, And a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, and they did not prevail, nor was place found for them in heaven any longer. 
The angel Michael being the archangel. There's only three angels mentioned in the Bible. There's the angel Gabriel who came and gave, uh, you know, evidence of the birth of Jesus. There is the angel Michael who was the archangel, the warrior angel. And there was Lucifer who was cast out of heaven, who became the devil and Satan. They were all archangels. So when you hear people say they pray to angels, we're not supposed to pray to angels. There's only three angels mentioned in the Bible. Out of all the angels God created, he only gave names three. Now, one thing about my mother and father, I have to say they didn't do a lot for me in life. They were great people, but they never done a lot for me. God bless them both. They're both, they're both dead now, but I have no animosity towards them. They were born in difficult times. And it was very difficult for them to be parents. Some people adapt to being a parent. My mother and father never adapted to be a parent. But one thing my father did, because he was Irish, he gave me the name Michael. Because a lot of Irish people give their sons the name Michael. Because they think oh, Michael's an Irish name. It's not, it's a Jewish name. Michael means who is like unto God. So I was grateful to be given such a name. Who is like unto God. They thought they was giving me a name of an Irishman. You know, but I wasn't. They were giving me the name of an archangel. So I'm always grateful for that. Let me carry on. And it said, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast with him. It said, Now I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brethren. Who we'll accuse them before our God day and night has been cast down. And listen to this. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. These two young, lovely young ladies gave testimony this morning. One of the easiest ways to overcome the devil is to give testimony. Amen. Lots of people won't give testimony because they think the only testimony is valid is when the heavens have opened up and they've seen angels descend on a ladder. You give any testimony, any testimony. I have a testimony this week, my car broke down this week, the clutch went, and I thought I'd have to come in today by tube, and I live a long way away, and I thought I'd have to come in today by tube. And a lady, I know, who is a very, very strict and harsh Christian, very strict and harsh, she actually called me over to see her, and I had to spend 270 pounds to get my car fixed, and I had, as the old saying goes, Rob Peter to pay Paul. I had gone and seen where there was any money hidden, and I took it off to get my car. And to be honest with you, I was £98 overdrawn in the bank, and I've got £100 overdraft. So I had £2 left. And this lady rang me up and gave me £300. She said, a man of God's got around the car, and she called me over to see her, and she gave me £300. Amen. So you give a testimony. Why are you giving testimony? It shames Satan. Oh, yeah. Satan wants to hear bad stories. Yeah. Satan wants to hear that you can't cope with your little girl and you're, you're at the end of your tether and you want to give her up for adoption. That's what Satan wants to hear. That's what he wants to hear. He wants to hear that sort of thing. Satan wants to hear of people breaking up their relationships, not making their relationships stronger. So it says here, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Listen to this. Therefore rejoice, O heaven, and you indwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down, having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. Now I'm going to read you the rest of this. I'm sorry it's so long. He said, now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to a place where she is nourished for times and half and half a times from the presence of the serpent. In other words, she was taken to Egypt. When Jesus was born, remember Mary took him across the sands to Egypt, away from the terror that was going on in Bethlehem and in Israel. And hallelujah. And it goes on to say, but the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened his mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. 
Satan is against all Jews, all people in Israel, and all Christians. Satan is against them because you have the testimony of God and you have the testimony of Jesus. Now open doors, what are open doors in our lives? Open doors in our lives are things that are there in our lives which sometimes we're aware of, sometimes we're not. These are the four main areas where Satan will exploit. The ancestral and generational bloodline. I tell you the story, I knew a lady once who came from Jamaica and her name was Merlene. And I was asked to take her through deliverance because she was manifesting very badly in the church and she was shouting and screaming and she was making various noises. And when I met her, the Holy Spirit said, ask her about her grandmother. And I said, Mer Merlene, tell me about your grandmother. And she said, well, what do you want to know about my grandmother for? I said, tell me about your grandmother. He said, my grandmother was a Sunday school teacher in a Baptist church. I said, okay. The next week came when I came to see her. I said, tell me about your grandmother. And she got angry with me. She started shouting at me. She said, why are you asking about my grandmother? So I let it go. The third week came and I said, tell me about your grandmother. And she started screaming at me. I told you never to mention my grandmother again. She was a Sunday school teacher. Why are you persecuting her? I said, God has told me to ask you about your grandmother. So on the fourth week, I started praying for her and I said, Marlene, tell me about your grandmother. And she laid on the floor and banged her fists on the floor and started screaming. And she said, God, and she said, okay, you win. My grandmother was a witch. You see, none of us want to think bad of our ancestors. We want to think our ancestors were doctors. We want to think that they were barristers. We don't want to think that any of them was involved in the occult. But we have to face facts as Christians that some of our ancestors was involved in the occult. I know mine was. That's number one, the ancestral bloodline. All iniquity and sin that comes from the ancestral bloodline must be cut off right back to the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve. Because believe it, all of us in this room are related to Adam and Eve. It might seem strange to see that because I look different than you, you look different than me, but all of us can trace our roots back to the Garden of Eden. So when we break ancestral sin, we have to break it back to the Garden of Eden. Hallelujah. Secondly, the occult. Now, witchcraft is about hubble bubble, toil and trouble that they speak about in Shakespeare. A big pot and they put a frog in there and they put a snake in there and they put all this sort of thing. Witchcraft is feeling down and ringing up a tarot line on the telephone. Witchcraft is going to see a fortune teller when you want to know how your future is going to be. Witchcraft is going to a spiritualist church where people contact your dead ancestors. That is all witchcraft. If we have done any of those things, we have to be separated from them. Because Satan is looking in that open door. Yes. And he will send people to you, he will send information to your house, you will be tempted to look on the internet to these sites, these things like that. That's what it is. The third one is sexual sin. And I always feel difficult talking about this because when I was a young man, and you know, I, I am 62 now, so it was a long time ago when I was a teenager, a long time ago. But back in the 1960s, we was encouraged to engage in sexual sin. They called it the permissive society. And it was no longer wrong to have multiple sexual partners. It was no longer wrong to get girls pregnant. It was no longer wrong to do any of those things. There is one thing that we need to know. That when we have sex with someone, one of the first things that we have is we join a soul tie with that person. A soul tie is an invisible piece of string that attaches us to that person. That's why when that relationship breaks up with her, we don't know what to do. We go to the next relationship and that breaks up as well. We go to the one after that and it breaks up because every time we're building soul ties. I want to tell you a story, this is a true story. I was called to a church in Brixton. I know Brixton very well, I was born and brought up in Brixton. I come from that part of London. And this pastor was manifesting very badly. I had quite a large church and it was manifesting badly. When I went to him, 
he was behaving very strange. And I said to him, are you, first thing I said, are you cheating on your wife? Are you committing adultery? Because I have to be honest with people. Because if people want to be set free, they have to be honest. Because you can't hide from God. There's many people that go to church and they go, hallelujah, praise the Lord, and they lift their hands. And as Pastor said, they're going through lip service. They're miles away from God. Their mouths might be close to God, but their hearts are miles away. And I saw this man and he said, no, I'm not cheating on my wife. So I said to him, well, let me ask you a question. And he had the same name as me, Michael. And I know him very, very well. I've known him many years. I was actually brought up with him in Brixton. I knew him from when he was. I said, how many women did you sleep with before you got married? And he said, well, there's too many to count. So I said, how many do you think? He said, minimum 50. So I said, 50? And he said, yeah, I couldn't believe it, 50. I thought, well, I knew this man. Well, obviously, I never. I obviously knew him at certain times. I want to give you a scenario. Is anyone good at mathematics in the room? Anyone good at mathematics? I'm sure the class is good at mathematics. I'm sure she's good at everything. Yes. Not just mathematics. I'm yes. sure she's good at everything. Yes. I, want to give you an, I want to give you an example. A girl is a virgin. She falls in love with a man. The man said, will you sleep with me? She said, no, I'm saving myself for my marriage for the man I'm going to love. And he said, you don't have to worry about me. I'm not promiscuous. I've only ever slept with four women. Now, let's take this as a scenario. If those four women he has slept with have each slept with four men each, the first time she's intimate with him, there's 16 soul ties to break. If those 16 women also have four partners each, the first time she sleeps with him, there's 64 soul ties to break. If the 64 people have also had four partners each, the first time she sleeps with him, there's 232 soul ties to break. You're not only sleeping with him, you're sleeping with everyone he's ever slept with. If he slept with a witch, if, if, uh, if they've slept with Freemasons, wizards, people like that, people who hate Christ, atheists, agnostics, people who are involved in cults, then the characteristics of that person is passed on to you. You start feeling depressed, you start feeling anxious, sometimes you even feel suicidal. That is an open door. You know the thing that Satan uses to, to get people to fall is usually sex. It's the easiest way because Satan plays with the heart. And what Satan has been able to do is convince the world that sex is the same thing as love. He's been able to convince people that sex is the same thing as love. You turn the television on, you see gay sex on the television all the time. You see it on the TV all the time now, men kissing men. I'm told when the Commonwealth Games opened the other night, it opened up with two men kissing each other. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Two men kissing each other on the Commonwealth Games. That's another open door. The other open door that we have in our lives is our belief system with Jesus. Many, many people have strange belief systems, even some Christians. There's Christian denominations out there that don't believe in the Holy Spirit. There's Christian denominations out there that don't believe in the Holy Trinity. If you ever meet someone who doesn't believe in the Holy Trinity, this is what I want you to tell them. That at Jesus' baptism, Father, Son and the Holy Spirit were evident and present. Jesus was in the water, it's the Son. The words came down from heaven, this is my Son who I am well pleased, God the Father spoke. And then the dove descended and touched Jesus Amen. with the power of the Holy Amen. Spirit. So nobody can tell you there's not a Holy Trinity. Yes. It's present there. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's go back to Revelation 12 again. Hallelujah. And let's look at voices, verses 10 to 12. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brethren that stands before our God day and night has been cast down. Satan is cast to the earth and it is his job before the appointed time to create as much maya as he can. To create families, to break up, for women to have miscarriages, for women who can't, who fear so greatly having children to have abortions. 
This is what Satan wants to do, to ruin their lives. When you have all these things, I used to be the most depressed person in the world. You know, one day I got in bed, this is the truth, I got in bed one day and I covered myself up with the clothes and I prayed to God and I said, God, take me this afternoon and I don't want to live any longer. And I actually prayed that to God and I laid in the car and I fell asleep and I fell into a deep sleep. Then all of a sudden I wanted to wake myself up. And I couldn't wake up. I was trying to wake up and I generally thought I was dying. And when I forced myself to wake up, I repented to God. And I said, I'm sorry for asking such a prayer. I said, I'm sorry for asking such a prayer. And I repented of it. And I wanted God to take me because I couldn't cope with life any longer. Someone very close to me had been unfaithful to me and they had hid these facts for many, many years that they had been unfaithful to me and it had grieved me terribly. And I've never looked back now. And I'm never unhappy, I'm never sad. Amen. Because I hear distressing stories every day of the week. Could you go to Mark 16, please? Mark 16, verses 14 to 18. Hallelujah. We're going to be talking about authority now. Did you know, put your hands up if you know, and I know there's not many of us, it's not like being at school, but put your hands up if you know you have authority over the devil. Good, Anna, that's right. You all know you have authority over the devil. Let me tell you about this authority now. Hallelujah. Let's look at Mark 16. Verses 14 to 18. It's called the Great Commission. This is called the Great Commission. These are the last words spoken by Jesus on the earth before he went to be with the Father in heaven. And he left us with authority. Amen. One of the reasons I know, you know, let me tell you about the first deliverance I ever did. I was working for a big American ministry and I was, I was just a usher. And I was standing by the bookstore one day, and there was two African women there. One was from Sierra Leone, and one was from Ghana. And I didn't know, they both started staring at me. And then they came to me and they said, is your name Michael? And I said, yes. They said, would you pray for my friend? I said, I can't pray for anyone, I'm only an usher. And you know what I said? I said, I haven't even been to Bible college. Because I thought you had to go to Bible college and you had to have a Doctorate of Divinity and a Master's degree before you could pray for anyone. I got a Doctorate of Divinity now, it took me five years. I did it for a little learning, but I did do it. And I hadn't done any studying so that I left school. And when I went to school, I played truant all the time. The last two years of school, I really left school at 13. Because I didn't attend much from 13 to 15. Because I used to be out playing football, smoking cigarettes. Trying to chat girls out. That's what I used to do from 13 onwards. Hallelujah. So these two girls came to me and they said, would you pray for my friend? I said, well, I can't pray for you, but I'll get a pastor. There's loads of pastors at this convention. I'll get a pastor to pray for you. I said, what do you want? There's Nigerian pastors, pastors from Ghana, pastors from the Philippines. There's a couple of Americans there. You tell me what you want, I'll go and get you one. And they said, well, we want you to pray. I said, well, I can't pray for anyone. They'd get very annoyed with me if I prayed for anyone, because I'm not a pastor. They said, the Holy Spirit told us to come and see Michael. Amen. And I said, well, I think the Holy Spirit's made a mistake. That's the first thing I said. I said, I think the Holy Spirit's made a mistake. So they said, no, pray. And this lady took my, took my hand and put it on her tummy. And her tummy was moving around like a washing machine. It was going round and round and round, and it really felt like that there was something like a snake or something nasty in her stomach. And I said, what is this? They said, witchcraft. So I said, okay. So, earlier that day, I had spoken in tongues for the first time. Amen! I'd been in this church, and I was laying out chairs, and a man, a Jamaican man called Freddie, Freddie Frinton his name was, and he was an usher like me, and he asked me to put some chairs out with him. And he said, oh, Michael, Brother Michael, will you put some chairs out? And I said, yes, of course, Fred. And as I went to speak, I went, la ma ma sha ma ma shi ba 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 sa ma ma shi ma ma ya And the man got fed up. He stood there for about five minutes, and I couldn't speak to him in English. So he went like that to me and just walked away and left me standing there. So these two girls came towards me, and I laid hands on one of these girls, 
And I said to her, in the name of Jesus, come out of this woman now. Go and never come back. And her tongue shot out of her mouth like that. This is the truth. It come out like that. And then we went back in and she fell to the floor. So I went and got a pastor and he said, well, whatever they are, it's gone. It's gone. Whatever was there, it's not there now. So the next day we was in Brixton Town Hall, there was a meeting there, and I got there a bit late. And when I got there, these two girls was giving testimony about the Lord had set them free, and they'd given their life to the Lord. So I said to this girl, I can't believe it. I said, I thought you was already a Christian when you come for prayer. She said, no, no, I was a Muslim. She said, I'd been to all the mosques and they couldn't cast it out of me. She said, it was only when you prayed in the name of Jesus that it came out. So remember, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. And the Bible says, in the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Turns, some will bow in reverence to the Lord. Yes. Some will bow in terror because they know the game's up. And there's no hiding place for them any longer. They have to accept him or they have to die. And it's their choice. So let me read what it says here to you, this great commission. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. See the authority. Jesus hadn't said, make people pastors, make people bishops, make people archbishops. He said, baptize them that they believe. So everyone in this room has authority over the demonic, has authority. You don't need me to cast a demon out, you can do it yourself. Hallelujah! By faith. Yes. Everyone has that ability. Amen. So what I want to tell you today, there's no reason. The greatest tool that the enemy uses against us is fear. He gets in our mind and he tells us he can control us. He gets in our mind and tells us, tells us he will always be in charge. He sends us bad dreams and nightmares. Who's ever had a bad dream? Do you get many bad dreams? When I was a child, I used to get dreams of a nuclear holocaust. I used to see the mushroom cloud going up over London. And I used to see their bones used to fall on the floor. I used to be so terrified, my father used to pick me up out of the bed and put me in bed with him because I was so scared. And in the morning, when I went in the room, the bed clothes were soaking wet like someone had poured a bucket of water on them where I used to sweat so much in the terror. I am taken now to the dark realms on a regular... I've been, I've been to the dark places five times. Jesus has taken me. I've confronted the devil three times, I've seen him in the flesh. And three times he's attacked me at all times. I have had cancer, I have had tuberculosis, I have had diphtheria, I have had many, many diseases. A few years ago I was crippled with rheumatoid arthritis. The devil appeared to me by the side of the bed and he pointed at me and he said, Michael, I will kill you in five years. Well, to be honest with you, it was hot weather like this. And I can't sleep under the bed clothes. So I was sleeping on top of the sheets. And because it was so hot, they had no clothes on. So I jumped out of bed and confronted the devil. And I think the sight of him seeing me with no clothes on terrified me. And he left straight away. A few weeks after, I was struck down with rheumatoid arthritis. My hands were like claws. I couldn't comb my hair, couldn't brush my teeth. I couldn't have a shave. I couldn't even get my shoes on, my feet and all my joints were, were like that. So I was, went to the hospital when I saw a special and gave me cancer drugs. Bone cancer drugs to take me, it made my hair fall out and I felt sick. I never felt so ill in all my life. And one day I thought enough and I took all the drugs and I flushed them down the toilet. So if there was any rats in the sewers that had cancer, they're all better now because of the drugs I flushed down the toilet. But I didn't take any drugs again. 
and the Lord healed me. I want to show you something. This is for someone with rheumatoid arthritis. Just watch this. I couldn't even lift my legs up. I couldn't even lift my legs up at all. I have no pain. When I went back to see the specialist 20 months later, he discharged me. He said, you've got no arthritis in your body. Amen. At all. the devil all the time. And now the Lord takes me to the dark realms and I see Satan on a regular basis and I stand there and I rebuke him in the name of Jesus. Amen. I was taken to heaven a couple of years ago and I saw somebody, a friend of mine who died and I met him in heaven. Jesus taught me there to see him. And I knew heaven was real. And I knew the peace of God was so great. So let anyone tell you that Christianity is not real. Let anyone tell you that Jesus Christ is just a prophet. Let anyone tell you that Jesus is a rabbi. They are liars. Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. And if you live your life to Jesus, you will never turn back. You will still have problems. You will still have gas bills you can't pay. You will still have a car that fails its MOT. Yes. You will still have a pair of shoes in the hole with holes in the bottom. But Jesus will never leave you or forsake you anywhere in your life. I put it in the truth. I've been there and I know it. I'm retired now and I live on an old age pension. I get approximately £135 a week to live on. I have to tell you, I tithe more than that. I give, I give all the money away I get. I help people out who are in trouble. I give them money on a regular basis. It makes me feel good to give people money. If I can bless someone for their birthday, if I can bless someone at Christmas, it makes me feel good. That's why I do it. As soon as I do it, God releases blessings to me. And I'm you can't out you can't have time, God, because he owes all the money to start with. But you know what Psalm 24 said? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein. Yes. Everything is owned by God. Amen. Hallelujah. Can you not turn to Luke 10, please? Luke 10, verses 17 to 20. I want to confirm that you have authority over the devil. Hallelujah. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Did you like the song I sang? Yes. I tell you a funny story. There was a woman who was dying in the hospital. And I went to see her in the hospital. And I stood in the hospital ward. And I sang that song. And there was all sick people in beds. And some of them sat up. Some of them started crying. Some of them even received Jesus when I sang that song. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to the name of the Lord. Hallelujah we pray now. Luke 10. Verses 17 to 20. Jesus sent 70 out and he said, Carry nothing with you. Go to all the towns, go to all the villages, heal the sick, raise the dead, proclaim the name of the Lord. And he blew upon them. He blew upon them. He blew upon them and they received the Holy Spirit. And we're going to go now. Verse 17. He said, Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Amen. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. <laughs> When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's there. You have authority over the demons, but Jesus said, rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Rejoice, because only God knows when the end time will come. Only God knows, not even Jesus knows. And when the end time will come, you will go and be the Lord in heaven and you will be there for all eternity. But Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So Jesus himself witnessed the event when the angel Michael cast the devil out of heaven. Amen. Now Jehovah's Witnesses, let me tell you something, if 
you ever talk to Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah's Witnesses will argue that Jesus is the same as the angel Michael. Because they will take this scripture where Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And they will take the scripture from Revelation 12 where it says a war broke out in heaven. And they will link the two together. And they say, well, Jesus must be the angel Michael. That's why they take Jesus out of the Holy Trinity. Hallelujah. So, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I give you authority to trample on snakes, to tread on scorpions. Remember in biblical times, in Judea 2,000 years ago, the most dangerous thing was a snake. Probably the second most dangerous thing was a scorpion. The third most dangerous thing was a Roman, I suspect, in Jesus' time. But snakes and scorpions, we don't, they're dangerous now, aren't they? Snakes and scorpions are dangerous now. I'm going to Ghana next year for a long, for the preaching six churches. And I'm sure that I'll see plenty of snakes, spiritual snakes, as well as physical snakes. I expect I'll see loads of them. So remember this. Everyone in this room, no matter about your circumstances, no matter about your finances, no matter about your family life, no matter the people that have let you down, that have hurt you, that have disregarded you, that have rejected you, that have caused you all sorts of pain and suffering, you are a child of God and you have authority over the devil. He can never take that away from you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can I sing another song for you? Yes. This is another song I wrote. I write a few songs every now and again. I haven't had the, the inkling to write some. And this one's called The Call. It's called The Call. And it goes like this. I heard the call in the day of the night. Follow me, follow me, follow me. I know my Lord Jesus has sent his guiding light. Follow me. Uh, just say very quickly that 
I'm so happy that you said exactly what I always say that God can use any of us. Any of us. Anytime. Just be available. He said in Isaiah, who? He wants to send someone. Who will I send? In Isaiah. Who? You don't want to smoke any more cigarettes. You don't want to do that, okay? My mother died of lung cancer. She, true, she did. Don't smoke any more cigarettes, all right? It's no good for you. And it will take away your beauty and your good looks and you don't want to lose that, do you? Because you want to meet a nice man who's going to fall in love with you and make you his wife, don't you? So there you go. Smoke no more Anyone else want prayer? Come forward, please. They're on they're fright that they're going to fall over. Oh, that's the one. Well, that's not me, that's the only scary. Come on, Sarah, you're, you know. How are you feeling these days? You look very, very good, Sarah. Just lift your hands to the Lord now. Lord, we lift up Sarah to you now. And I know that you have touched her, Lord. She looks radiant this morning, Lord. And I know the hands of the Lord her God has been upon her now. And I ask you to fill her with fresh anointing today, Lord. And meet all of her needs according to your riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And I ask you, I've got this word for you now, which I'm going to give you now. It's from 3 John 2, and it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper. And be in health as thy soul prosper. Receive it now, Sarah, in the name of Jesus, that the anointing of the Holy Ghost come upon her now. There we go. Peace. You are completely delivered. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. You are completely delivered. The Lord has set you free. Amen. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anyone else want to pray? Come and let me bless you in your little baby. Come and let me bless you in your little baby. Alright, alright. Alright, thanks for coming forward, sir. What's your name again? Bob, lift your hands to the Lord, Paul. Have you accepted Jesus yet? You have, alright. You're not baptised yet. You're not baptised. Well, you must be baptised. You must go in the water. Okay? You must go in the water. In the name of Jesus. Because baptism comes from the ancient Jewish ceremony of the mikvah, which means going in there dirty and coming out clean. Okay, in Jesus' name we left up Paul. And I ask you, can someone stand behind you? Stand behind you, please. In the name of Jesus, we pray, Lord, that you will lose Paul now from any problems in his life, from any anxiety and things that derive from his childhood. We pray now that you will touch him from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. And we pray blessings unlimited in his life now. In the name of Jesus we pray. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not his benefits. Who forgiveth thine iniquities, who healeth thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction. In the name of Jesus, fill him now, Lord, and let that anointing come upon him. Grant him the peace of God which surpasses all understanding that will keep his heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And I'm going to pray for you now. In the name of Jesus, I command that the problems you get with your chest, the breathing difficulties you sometimes have, will leave you completely. Any sinus blockages you have or blockages in your esophagus will go now and you will be healed. In the name of Jesus Christ. There we go. Receive it now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. How are you? Uh, Big Brother is not here. What's your name, sweetheart? We ain't, have we? Oh, we are. How long ago was it? Four months ago. Four months ago. And your name is Sam again? Regina. Regina. Oh, well. You know, I've got the most shocking memory in the world.